Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Story Hero podcast. Uh, today, I'm joined by Emma Kilduff, uh, co-founder and CEO of the Fortier Group. Over the number, over the last couple of months, I suppose we've spoken to a ton of founders who one day, I suppose, dream of exiting their business, um, and that's what Emma specialises in in his work at the Fortier Group. So, the Fortier Group are a lower to mid market investment bank focused on e-commerce companies uh, in the range of about two to two hundred million. Emma, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Tom. Good to be here. Absolutely. Uh, really, really great to have you on board today. Um, for the purposes of our audience, would you care to give a bit of an introduction, maybe your own background and what you're currently working on? Sure. Um, I mean, my, my um, I guess my career started uh, way back in 2000, the year before I did a master's in e-commerce. Uh, so that's relevant for this discussion. I've been interested in e-commerce for 25 years. I have a few gray hairs, uh, probably unlike <laughs> a lot of your listeners. Um, um, uh, you, 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 you might recall in the year 2000, um, it was maybe less about e-commerce, more about dot-com at the time. And I was fascinated with all these internet IPOs. So I wanted to, I wanted and did join the world of investment banking to get a, get a piece of that action. Um, so started, um, uh, working in London for an investment bank called Credit Suisse in 2000, um, where I started doing deals, uh, really liked the buzz of doing a deal whether it's initial public offering on a stock exchange or helping a business get bought or sold or helping raise equity or credit for for a, for an entrepreneur. And um, over the course of my career, I've done over $20 billion worth of, of, of corporate finance deals um, uh, of all sorts of sizes, ranging from a $10 billion IPO to raising a million bucks for my own startups. Um, and... Um, Worked worked uh, in Morgan Stanley, probably one of the top three investment banks in the world with Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan. But my father was a tech entrepreneur, so I always had the entrepreneurial instinct in my blood. Um, so I've done four startups. Um, uh, we'll talk about the Fortier Group and, and maybe also about a new one I've just launched uh, a few weeks ago. Um, so I, I hope I hope that helps uh, communicate that I can resonate with entrepreneurs. I'm not just a geeky corporate finance investment banker. I have started businesses. I know how hard it, hard it is. The blood, sweat, and tears that have to be invested, <laughs> and ultimately the reward that one wants. Um, most businesses, it's all about the ultimate check you get when you sell it. Uh, maybe more so than tech businesses. You know, our cash flow, uh, cash flow businesses are good along the way, but for most of your audience, it's it's the big check at the end, and it's so important to plan ahead for that, that so that you um, you, the hardworking entrepreneur, get get the right return. Um, so, in a nutshell, uh, investment banker stroke entrepreneur. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, I'm sure doing a master's in 99 or 2000 for e-commerce was quite different to what one might uh, get into in a, in a, in a lecture in, for that kind of course today. <laughs> yeah, like there were no books, exactly. Um, uh, it was so fresh, so new. Um, uh, the way we were thought really was by getting guest guests to come in, entrepreneurs uh, to come in and retailers to come in and talk to us about what they were actually doing uh, because the books were, were sort of being written at the time. They weren't published, <laughs> yeah, which was great. I mean, that, I, I love that sort of learning. It's sort of classroom-based learning from real people as opposed to just going through the mill learning from books. Really getting stuck into the weeds of it and having to figure it out. I love it. Um, <laughs> in terms of the Fortier Group, I've kind of given a brief overview there. Would you be able to kind of talk through what that looks like on a day-to-day -day basis? How do you guys operate? Yeah, well, look, the, the big opportunity we see is we're trying to bring Wall Street level of service, a Morgan Stanley type level of service to the small mid-cap e-commerce space. We're not a broker. We're not a listing website. We're trying to do a small number of high quality deals each year. And when we do a deal, we're pretty intense uh, in terms of our uh, workload and our advice. Um, our advice really is similar to an investment bank in terms of we help uh, clients raise equity, raise credit, and prepare for an exit of sale. Um, equity is really tough for e-commerce right now. Uh, we're not necessarily looking for loads of mandates there because it's very hard to do. Credit is tough but doable, and m and is, is definitely doable. Volumes. Um, the H2 2022 volumes were at a seven to eight year low. Uh, they improved a little bit last year and they'll definitely improve this year, particularly when interest rates um, reduce. Definitely. So you guys deal with not just D2C, but you deal with a hell of a lot of FBA, I'd imagine, as well, to some extent. We certainly started there um, because of the, the, you know, the, the craziness when there was 100 Thrasios chasing FBA brands. That was the obvious place for us to go as an intermediary. 
Yeah. Um, but we've definitely migrated uh, uh, to do more TTC work. That's probably our primary focus over FBA, although we do both. Um, and this year, we're also starting to do more work with um, e-commerce SaaS and technology businesses. Um, so we look at the full spectrum of e-commerce. We, we, we'd even look at an e-commerce agency, an e-commerce logistics business. Um, you know, our, our big North Star, our mission is to become the Morgan Stanley for e-commerce by 2030. Um, and to do that, we need to look at all types of e-commerce across all geographies um, and, um, and, you know, execute successful deals across all of the above. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And you, cut, you kind of touched on Thrashio there. Obviously, you grabbed a hell of a lot of media coverage in the past couple of years, um, as did a lot of the, the aggregator market. Just for some of our listeners who maybe aren't familiar with what a typical aggregator is, could you kind of walk us through exactly what an aggregator is? and understand kind of how do the commercials typically work from an aggregator? Like what's a win from their perspective when they're looking to buy up these brands, obviously in an ideal scenario? Well, it's interesting. The term aggregator is, 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 um, is maybe a relatively new term on what used to be called or is called in some circles still a roll-up. So the concept of a roll-up of businesses has been around for decades. Uh, the most famous roll-up is a Canadian company called Constellation Brands which has been acquiring successfully software businesses for decades. And it's listed on the stock exchange, hugely successful. Um, private equity firms really like backing roll-ups um, because um, there's an opportunity to um, buy businesses at a relatively low multiple compared to what the mothership is valued at. So you buy lots of businesses, you improve their operations with, with the centralized uh, you know, team and operations, and then you can either sell, sell the entire lot to, uh, or, or just keep running the entire lot like Constellation at higher multiples. Um, the term aggregator maybe a little bit, in a little bit, of, in, a, in a, to some extent, excuse me, has, has, has become a dirty word because of the difficulties that some of the e-commerce aggregators has faced. Because like, if, you take, uh, if you take one of the early aggregators, they acquired over 100 brands in a lot of instances. They, they paid very high prices because of COVID and the supply demand for these types of assets. And then we had, you know, the like for likes were really tough because the world came crashing down from an e-commerce perspective. And so you bought high, you have high high uh, credit costs, and uh, you maybe haven't set yourself up in a great way to operate 100 brands. So the pressure from an operational perspective comes up. Um, that's a really tough position to be in. I mean, um, I don't think any business in the history of the corporate world has acquired more than 100 businesses in two years. I don't think it's ever happened. So uh, it must have been really tough to be the COO and CFO and CEO of any of those businesses. Um, so they face difficulties. Now is a great time to be a buyer, but buying all those brands two to three years ago, like, you know, in retrospect, and hindsight's wonderful, isn't it? And, uh, <laughs> you know, um, it, it, it was tough. Um, but the concept of a roll up or an aggregator has been proven to work for. 50 years that's that's not up for debate and i'll and i'll debate i'll debate that with anyone who wants to take take me on one-on-one -on -one. that's not up for debate the debate is uh it does it work in this industry and i still think it does uh, but if you're going to do it in e-commerce to me you could, you're more likely to succeed if, if you have a few things in place if you have a niche strategy so don't try try excuse me and buy all products across all geographies and frankly, don't try and buy products. You, buy, you want to buy brands with a capital B. And that's an important message for your listeners. Like no one wants to buy a product, a spatula that will ultimately compete with the Chinese factory. Um, and you have to have amazing operators. You can't have boring bankers like me, right? I mean, <laughs> I can sell a business, but I can't operate it for my life. And I know your listeners can operate a business, but I don't think they could sell a business as well as I can. Right? We all have our strengths uh, and weaknesses. And so... Um, uh, if you buy well and you buy proper businesses in a, with a specific niche and you have great operate, operating teams that know what to do with them, then, then you have a good chance of being a successful aggregator. And to your, to your point, like the press only talk about the bad examples. And there are lots of aggregators doing very, very well. No one talks about those. Um, so, um, yeah, they're my, they're my thoughts. Misery sells. Um <laughs> 
Um, okay, j- just to an important point is to kind of just go in on that. So within an aggregator, just for anyone listening, so the aggregator could come along, buy your business, and then absolve the GNA, so your your rent, staff costs, and absolve them into the underlying kind of infrastructure that's already in place for the aggregator. So then they can benefit from, I suppose, really reducing the operational expense burden of running that business and really just kind of hold on to the CM3 and hope to kind of grow that contribution margin and hope to grow, grow that along with the business. So they kind of benefit from, I suppose, economies of scale by bringing multiple brands under the one umbrella and having kind of a centralized team internally to which to manage those brands. Is that correct? Yeah. Now, of course, you know, it's not like they can fire everybody and, and not replace sure. those people with, with their expertise. But yeah, it's more scalable uh, to have a centralized function. Um, I, I think a lot of the aggregators have learned from private equity firms uh, who historically have always kept on the key people of, of of a company acquired. The aggregators initially maybe were a little bit too confident and, <laughs> and thought they didn't need those people. But there's so much in their brains that it's hard to replicate and hard to you know just download in a few weeks. So now you're seeing aggregators keep people on. Um, but yes, to your point, yeah, you you, um, you know it's hard if, if you look take a typical FBA business. Generally, it's run by uh, an individual and some VAs, and um, that individual can't can't be an expert at everything from finance, like what you guys do, to to marketing, to supply chain, to, you know, to product dev, a new NPD. They can't be an expert at all of the above. And so um, they can't be great at all of the above. Let's be honest, right? They, they'll have, we all have our strengths and weaknesses. So if you take that brand and put it into a centralized team that have expertise in all those areas, there's much likely a chance that it will do better. Was there a tipping point? Obviously, as we kind of mentioned, hindsight is always twenty twenty. But was there a tipping point? And I mean, I just look at my own experience in the past couple of years, and I'd imagine, you know, it's quite similar in your line of work that like iOS fourteen fused with a mix of COVID, everybody shopping online, and zero interest rates, zero percent interest rates, a lot of disposable cash just meant that you know those those multiples, those inflated multiples that now look heavily inflated they were realistic and they were warranted for quite a long time due to a lot of external forces that were in the market at the time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, you know, interest rates were, were, were very low for um, a long period of time, which meant there was a lot of money flushing around. I mean, frankly, there still is. It's just a lot of it's not being put to work by private equity. Uh, there's a big wall of money there, dry powder, which we can maybe touch on. But um, sure. yeah, look, when, when, when COVID came, it fast-tracked growth of e-commerce by by x and uh, you know everything even even average brands looked amazing and and so um uh, i guess none of us forecast forecasted how tough the landing would be uh when people were allowed back out again and uh, post covid um uh, or at least no one really publicly discussed it uh, you know pe- people in, with hindsight say they say they knew that but i, I think that's a bit of bs to be honest <laughs> um um so um yeah i i, th- I think um well, let's look at the multiples for a second if you if, if, before Trasio, a typical fba business was valued in the very low single digits um then Trasio came along and 100 copycats came along and it went crazy the highest multiple we've heard of seven x for an FBA business, that's incredibly high. That's that's now come back down to two and a half to four and a half. And uh, that's just for, to clarify that that's a, that's a that's an EBITDA multiple, not not a revenue uh, multiple for anyone uh, listening. Yeah, uh, yeah, and and for Amazon, it's it, seller discretionary earnings, which is a term different for the DTC folks. Yeah, um, that's for that's for the typical profitable FBA business. Now there are always exceptions to the downside, which are distressed, and upside, which are diamonds, which are incredibly rare. On the DTC side, um. The uh, range today is quite wide. In, in in our view, it's 4x to 12x EBITDA. And it depends on everything from the quantum of revenue revenue growth, whether it is subscription uh, versus non-subscription, repeat purchase rate, and so on. And um, I think the DTC, uh, DTC brands, public listed DTC brands and private listed brands have had a, had a tough time, right? Because the iOS changes, the VCs are not following their money of existing investments or putting new money into our space. Um, so it's really tough to get equity rounds done, um, which makes it hard to grow because uh, CACs are so high and you know, all that stuff that your, your tool will show, will show clients. Um, but I, I'm rambling a little bit, but, but, but yes, look, December 2021 was when we saw the highest multiples. Um, 
I don't see multiples getting back to those levels. Um, but when interest rates do come down, when they come down, you know, valuations will will improve slightly from where they are today. Does does twenty 2020, twenty 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 one um and I suppose the the party that went with that from, from an exit perspective for a lot of brands, does that make your job more difficult when you're trying to talk to founders who are approaching the exit phase of their business and they're used to seeing these headlines around some of the, the stuff that might have gone on in the past couple of years? Does it kind of meet a does you do you meet a wall of unrealistic expectations and how do you try to look to realign those with people? Yeah, certainly uh, like 12 to 18 months ago, absolutely. Um, but then people, unless they've been hiding under a rock and haven't been reading the papers, you know, you know, you got to wake up and smell the coffee. Um, you know, just just look at any uh, share price of, a, of the listed uh, uh, e-commerce stocks, whether it's a brand or, you know, or a marketplace, they've been they've been hammered. Uh, so there's no getting away from it. Um, um, so, yes, it was very tough for us 12 to 18 months ago. Um, uh, there are, you know, uh, I, I think I think last year, frankly, a lot of the best e-commerce businesses decided not to sell uh, because they thought valuations, and rightly so, will improve. Um, they're not going to improve back to those lofty heights, uh, but they will improve, particularly again when interest rates reduce. Um, uh, but but um, look, I think most people are pretty sensible on expectations now. Otherwise, we don't we don't we don't. You know, we obviously want to get the best deal for our clients. But we have to we have to work with realistic clients, otherwise we're wasting their time and ours. So what you're saying is like even the last maybe not not maybe not right now, but for the last twelve to eighteen months, maybe wasn't a great time to sell a business because the the multiples were much lower. But I'm sure as an investor coming into the space, fantastic time if you have cash in the sidelines to actually go in and make investments in these businesses or often kind of snap them up in in times where the, where the multiples are a fraction of what they would have been a couple of years ago. Yeah, great time to be a buyer. And look, obviously. Uh, the whole the whole time thing of when someone sells, there's lots of factors that go into that, right? Someone sure. could be ill, or um, someone's wife could have died, and they just have a different outlook on life. Or uh, someone has started a new brand and wants to sell the old brand. Like, there's lots of reasons why people sell. It's not always it's not always about getting the highest highest price. Like life 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 is more important than 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 just getting <laughs> the highest price, right? When I, in life is short, we need to get on with life. Um, and so, um, so some people did sell last year, and good luck, good luck to them. Um, but, but, but I, yeah, I do think in the second half of this year, valuations will will improve slightly. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, you've obviously seen tons of of businesses go through the whole exit process. In terms of brands preparing for sale, like how how far out should the exit process start typically in in your experience? Yeah, this is a real bugbear of mine. Um, uh, when I worked on Wall Street. Firms that were thinking of selling, it's it's at least one to two year plan, uh, right? If you're Elon Musk and you want to sell X, you don't start you don't start a sale process next week or even in one month or three months. You 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 know you think about what's the roadmap to get there, and um, why shouldn't small and medium sized e commerce companies be following that best practice and, and approach? Um, so like if you fail to you know prepare fail to prepare prepare to fail. Um, um, there's so many, there's so many things that can be done. Even just say on a six to twelve month uh, view to improve a business's chance of a just getting a deal and b getting the deal at the right the right terms or better terms. So that that's um, so so uh, you know plan 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 as far out as you can. And just on that, what are some of the more typical mistakes that you see people go through? Where I know we're talking about, it's not all about getting that the highest multiple where possible. But in terms of brands that maybe have come to you that have maybe gone through an exit process over the years, has there been mistakes that have cost them potentially an extra one or two on, on the multiple of the EBITDA or, or or whatever it is for from the end result? Yeah, yeah. Well, like so, sometimes there's mistakes made that actually just kills the deal, right? So, um, uh. Ultimately, when you set a business, the investment committee of lots of acquirers will take a good look at your business and they'll determine whether whether they want to make an offer. And if so, what's their initial offer? Um, so first of all, you've got to get through the initial screening. Um, we, we had a we had a we had a client that this is about three years ago now. Um, 
where the buyer sent uh, an auditor of their uh, manufacturer in China to do an audit of, of the plant or the facility. And the score came back at like something like 3.6 out of 10. It was the worst score they've ever seen. And uh, that was just a big, big red flag. And the, the investment committee said, we don't want to deal with that brand. If that got out, if that got out to the press, that one of our suppliers is, has, has issues in terms of, you know, safety of the building, uh, you know, and, and some other things that, that aren't worth repeating. Like that's just, that just kills it. Um, uh, particularly, uh, you know, if a, a highly reputable private equity firm are a strategic uh, like a Procter & Gamble, you know, these types of firms, their reputation is absolutely paramount. So, you know, d deal's over. So, and that's just one example of a red flag. There are loads of examples we've seen where these are things you should start, again, thinking, what are they one, one to two years out and tick, start ticking them off to make sure that you're not, you're not going to have the red flags. And um, so that's red flags. Then there's obviously other things that you can do to, uh, you know, significantly improve your valuation. And, and, you know, a lot of it comes back to numbers, which, which, which is, you know, where you'll understand. So um, invest, what do investors love? Where should I focus my energy? And uh, what do they not like? So investors love subscription revenue. Is there a way to do that for your business model or not? If you can't, the second best thing is repeat repurchase rate. How can I improve that to show that there's real, real you know the, the customers love the brand you know i mentioned earlier like a brand with a capital b demonstrate it's not a product what's the organic search volume are people really searching for the brand not the product um what other ways can you demonstrate that it's a brand and start working on those today make them part of your kpis um what protection can you get what moats can you build is there any patents that you should have in place before you go to market? And they're just some of the examples, right? But, but it, some of these things cannot be done in weeks. Um, um, uh, are you on cash or accrual accounting? You know, um, what, um, uh, there's so many things that can be done. Um, I, and that's why we have this, this offering called evaluation audit, where we come in, look under the hood of a business uh, from the perspective of an acquisition investment committee. And, tell clients where what they'd be valued at today and then get advise them on what they should do on a one one year view a one to two year view um yeah it's it's not it's not a straightforward process and i often like so many areas of e-commerce are it's obviously you get into the fundamentals of business but it, often that's not what the the founder built their business to do you know they might be a, a brilliant might be started off being a side hustle in their kitchen and now it's morphed into a much bigger business they could have 50 100 staff and they're still that product owner at heart, but now they have to manage finance, they have to manage marketing, they have to manage the operations of the business. Going through a complicated process like a sale, you know, without the right advice, I suppose, can be terrible. And you might end up shooting yourself in the foot and really not getting what you deserve out of your business. And I just can't understate the importance of having proper guidance and I suppose mentorship going through that process to a certain extent. Yeah, look, I mean, uh, when you sell a house, you typically engage an advisor. Uh, I mm -hmm. don't know how to sell a house, um, uh, so I, I engage an advisor. Um, every S and P five hundred company, when they sell their business, they engage an advisor. So why do small e commerce entrepreneurs think that they can sell it better themselves than someone who's done it for nearly twenty five years and done twenty billion dollar worth of deals? It's it's um, it's it's crazy. Um, you know, take advice. Um, take advice from people who've been there, done that. Otherwise, it can cost you. And you know. You might know what money you've left on the table. Uh, there was a great study by the University of Alabama, which analyzed nearly 4,000 deals over 20 years and showed that good advisors can get valuations up to 25% higher than not having an advisor. Right? So um, uh, you, need, you, need, you need to run a proper competitive auction process in an appropriate way that Wall Street's been doing for 100 years to get the best outcome. I'm not. I'm not reinventing the wheel here. I'm just. I'm just trying to do a version of it for e-commerce, um, and uh, we hire advisors in all other walks of life. So I would encourage e-commerce entrepreneurs, yeah, to 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 work with uh, an appropriate advisor, whether it's us or, or or someone else. Brilliant. And in terms of the the sale process itself, so let's just say we've got over the first hurdle. We've prepared for sale properly. We've got it. We've got our guidance on board. Like how long? does that process typically take brands i'm sure there's so much nuance and the devil is in the detail but 
ballpark kind of how long from start to finish does that that process take sure yeah so for for a dtc based brand um or tcc led brand as opposed to an amazon brand it's typically four to six months from uh when you actually press the green light with the firm like us to to receiving the check and that includes things like preparation uh we we don't go to market with any brand unless we have um a thoughtful teaser a 50 page confidential information memorandum and a bespoke data room to a rolls royce standard uh then we go and we market that to all the buyers uh, we know, which can be strategics, private equity, and aggregators. Uh, and then we negotiate, you know, more term sheets based on the, you know, the interest levels of the buyers. Uh, then you get into due diligence. Then you get into closing. Um, so, like, there's a detailed seven-step um, process. Uh, we've explained that in our 90 page TTC exit guide, which is available on our website for free. Um, and there's lots of other tips in that, in that document, uh, for, for, for your listeners to learn from. Um, um, but yeah, four to six months. Um, I think, I think when the market improves in the second half of this year, um, the timetable is going to be more concrete or is more likely uh, that it's not going to be elongated because you're going to have more interest. Um, we've had deals, uh, frankly, where there's only been one bidder. That's okay because you can still get a deal away, right? But um, in the, you know, three years ago, we had one deal where we had twelve bidders, and um, you know, you get you get offers so quickly, you get the bids, you get competitive juices flowing, and you can get really great terms. And I, I think we won't necessarily get back to twelve bidders per deal, but I think <laughs> in the second half, with more money and lower interest rates, you'll um, You'll have more bidders, which gives you um, increased likelihood of getting deals done and, and hopefully at better prices. Has the kind of velocity of the deals, for instance, when you would have had 12 deals versus one competing for the same business, would deals have got done faster in the past than today? Is there a link to your DD process and a, an over more stringent process to make sure the business is what it says it is, that kind of brand with a capital B piece? Is there... Are brands being scrutinized more going through that exit process today, more so than they would have been in 2021? I think, uh, I think strategic, there's three types of institutional buyers, strategics, uh, private equity, and aggregators. I think strategics and private equity firms haven't changed their process diligence. It's, 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 it's always been very thorough and takes time. Aggregators in the heyday, yes, rushed their diligence. Uh, you know, we, had, we had one instance where we had multiple offers within five days. You know, that's, that's in hindsight ridiculous. It's crazy. Uh, how can they've done their diligence properly? And, you know, you, remember, you might remember that some aggregators were um, promoting that they could do a deal from start to finish within 30 business days. Uh, again, that's not very sensible business either. Um, my, my advice to the entrepreneurs is, frankly, take your time. Uh, find the right partner. Don't, don't, it's not about, you, you spend five, 10 years building your brand, whether you sell it in four months or five and a half months, frankly, is totally relevant, right? Get the right partner and get the right deal. So um, there's lots of planning that can be done in the run up to pressing the green light to start a process that takes four to six months, which can include getting your house in order, getting rid of the red flags, taking advantage of low hanging fruit, starting to flirt date marry. I love that concept, right? Who are the potential <laughs> buyers? Let's start flirting with them. Um, or at least getting on their radar because you want, by the time you press the green light, you want everyone to be waiting waiting for that teaser, waiting for those deal docs. Um, uh, you don't want it to be the first time they've heard of you because you know, you got to put your, your, yourself in the shoes of the buyer. They're very busy. They're looking at deals all the time. You've got to get yourself at the top of their list. And uh, you won't do that with a cold email on the 1st of January next year um you know no. and you'd be expecting to close four months later you know, that's 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 not the way the world works certainly with strategics and private equity so we kind of touched earlier in, in the show around the i suppose the, the concept of the aggregator absolving gna and kind of running that from a central team but if you are to get if you are to be successful in your exit often i suppose more so with probably dtc than fba there is an earnout time for for founders and often this can be longer or shorter um than they might anticipate have you seen that change since 2021 or can you give us some kind of rough rough benchmarks in terms of what typical earnout times look like um for founders well look um over the last few decades typical earnouts 
are like one to two years. And uh, in the last few years in the e-commerce world with aggregators, they were squashed. Um, and um, some people just wanted to take money off the table to run. But I think it's, I think it's reverting to the mean, reverting to the norm. As mentioned earlier, you know, the smart buyers want to keep the sellers on board for a certain period of time because they know how to run their business better than, mm. than they do, frankly. And it takes time to migrate that IP. So, um, um, uh, you know, again, it depends if it's FBA versus DTC, but it's, it's, uh, I would, um, it's anywhere from, it's not weeks, it's sort of, it's, it's at least, a, at least a quarter in my view, otherwise the, it's at least a quarter to two years. Um, it also depends, like you use the word earn out, right? But, um, there could be a different structure. It could be a, a two, a two step exit, right? Where you sell control today. So say you sell 60% today, but then you sell the balance either in one lot or in two lots down the, down the road. Um, so actually you, you might feel like, okay, valuations aren't great. I've loads of ideas. I can see the business growing. I don't want to get rid of every, all, all my equity today. I'll sell 60%. I'll choose a really good partner who knows how to grow the business, who, who can evidence it to me, knows my sector, knows my category, can, can bring the resource, human and financial. Brilliant. And I'll, I'll focus on my superpower, which might be new product development. They can focus on all the things, other things. And um, I'll be able to get two or three bites of the app. You know, so, so yeah, it, it depends on the deal structure, ultimately, which depends on what the entrepreneur wants, ideally. And we, we try and listen to the entrepreneur and ask lots of questions to really understand what's driving them and their team. And we try to obviously match that with, with, with the terms of, of an acquisition as best as possible. Brilliant. That, that, was, that was fantastic. Um, okay, we might leave it there for the M&A piece for now, but I do want to touch on to uh, the most exciting, uh, our newest business venture in your life at the moment. Um, do you want to give us some context on, on Pit Stop? Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, I had a health care about 18 months ago. Um, I had a heart procedure and um, that was a catalyst, a sort of a wake up call for me, Tom. Um, it made me realize how short life is. And um, there's a great book called 4,000 Weeks. That's typically how long we have. It's not that many when you do the maths. Um, and uh, it, 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 it made me realize, right, crikey, what do I want to get out of it? life uh, uh i wanted to do more focus on my bucket list my how to improve well-being and so on and so i went looking on the app store for an app to help me and i couldn't find anyone any app specifically for men to help men think about getting the most out of life or becoming the best version of oneself and as an entrepreneur that was a sort of a light bulb um i then uh, went and spent six months creating my own framework to help me improve my uh my life um, which was all about digesting the best content from books and podcasts, speaking to people. There's a terrible stigma in this world. Men don't talk about any of this stuff. Well, I started talking to everyone about it. But 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 even if you read every book in the world and talk to everyone in the world, it doesn't mean you're going to change. So uh, I, I analyzed great content. I spoke, to, I chatted to everyone I could, and then I tried to change, and I did make some changes. And then... Uh, and then eventually I realized, crikey, if this can help me, uh, I'm not the only bloke in this world that uh, isn't living a perfect life, right? Um, or am I? <laughs> and, and the answer is clearly there's others out there that need help as well. And so I therefore couldn't resist uh, productizing my framework into an app. And the app came out of stealth mode uh, only about 10 days ago. Uh, so this is timely as a podcast. Um, so the app is called Pit Stop. Uh, so I'm encouraging uh, men around the world to take a pit stop, ideally once a day, where you step back and you think about your life and you think about the various components and how you might be able to improve yourself to become the, the best version of yourself. And uh, there's really, again, there's three, three parts of the app, content, chat, and change. So from a content perspective, we summarize all the best books and podcasts around the world to our users. Um, how many self-help books have you bought and never read, right? Uh, and even if you do read them, you forget them. So we summarize them, but we also um, take all the actions from them and encourage you to think about those actions. So that's the first part of the app. The second is chat. 
we're encouraging conversation and chat amongst men to talk about everything from testosterone levels uh, through to mental health, all the stuff that a lot of people don't want to talk about but should talk about. And there's really sure. serious reasons uh, as to why we should talk about it. And then change. Uh, so for change, we've based it on the Wheel of Life, which you may have heard of. Um, it's been used for decades. Uh, literally, we've created a wheel um, and we've created six, six components of the wheel, which is all the components of a man's life. So think um, physical health, mental health, relationships, leisure, career, finance. That's basically the main components of our lives. And we ask you to score yourself today where you are and where you want to be for each of those. And we try and help you think about what habits and, and changes you want to make to improve your score. And that links back to the content and chatting to people about all of this. So that's it in a nutshell. It's um, it's available on the, on the app stores. If you put in Pit Stop Men's Health, uh, it'll come up. Um, it's free to trial. It's 60 bucks per year uh, to subscribe to. And um, I, I think it's a big opportunity to help individuals, but also to help corporates, uh, to help companies, uh, help the companies help their employees or male employees become uh, you know, better people, which ultimately would mean they're, they're better at their jobs. Really interesting. Just on the content piece, double click on that one, because as you said, I, I've, uh, I've a million of those self-help books at home that are just gathering dust. But also there's so many brilliant uh, kind of health podcasts that I know I probably should be listening to. Um, a lot of my friends listen to Andrew Huberman, for instance. Um, those podcasts are really <laughs> long and I just don't have the time to get to them. So the idea is to be able to kind of summarize the key takeaways from some of those books or podcasts is definitely very appealing. Do you get to choose your own books or podcasts or do you guys kind of pick out your best selection of them or how does that kind of process work? Yeah, we we, uh, we analyze data to see uh, uh, which books are the most read and which podcasts are the most uh, read and downloaded. Um, so it's data driven uh, to determine what, what, we, what we include. So for example, in the UK last week, uh, Food for Life by Tim Spector is uh, the most downloaded book. Uh, and interestingly, Atomic Habits was number three, but it was top 10 for the last 137 weeks, I think. Right. So so um, Atomic Habits we've done and, and Food for Life is on our in our funnel. Um, uh, but we absolutely, you know, welcome suggestions from our from our uh, our, our, our users as well. Um, um, yeah. Brilliant. So you're live 10 days. So that, that's great. The product sounds amazing. In terms of the business itself, you're live 10 days. I didn't hear you mention anywhere that you're, you're a coder. Have you built the app yourself or how have you gone about building, building the, the business? No, um, absolutely not. So uh, we've hired an agency uh, in Eastern Europe who build apps uh, for a living. Um, we'll bring development in-house in due course, but we've hired a great agency to start. And I'm, I'm chairman of this. I'm not CEO. Uh, I've never built and sold an app, so I don't think I'm the right guy for the job. I don't want to learn on the job. So we're hiring people uh, who've worked at successful wellness apps. And I'm sort of bringing together the whole team. Uh, we Brilliant. have five full-time people plus an agency at the moment. And, um, and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go from there. And is it, a, is it a quick install on the app store? You're kind of up and running pretty quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Again, your know, seven day free trial. Um, if nothing else, you can read the summaries of a few books for free. Um, and uh, hopefully, you know, that will help you make some changes. That's the whole goal. Our, our big mission, our North Star is to help millions of men uh, get more out of life, be the best versions of themselves by 2030. Um, that's, our, that's our big mission. And um, there's... Um, there's lots of serious reasons like you know, life expectancy is coming down, particularly in the States. Uh, men die younger than women. Uh, suicide is, is, is very significant with men. It's, you know, uh, 3X women. They're the really serious uh, mortal reasons, but there's lots of soft reasons like uh, we don't talk about any of this stuff. Why don't we talk about this stuff? And um, we don't learn enough about all this stuff either. And you know, you mentioned Huberman. I, I think Huberman's fantastic, but he's done over a hundred podcasts of an hour each. I just will never be able to listen to them all. So uh, I've got three businesses. I just I just don't have the time. But give me give me the ten minute synopsis of each. Brilliant. Uh, so we're trying to be we're trying to help people save time. Um, but ultimately, we're trying to help people make just small small improvements to their lives. That's that's the goal. 
and it can be so easy like you're 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 going at 100 miles an hour every day of the week just working 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 it can be very easy to kind of let your own personal health kind of subside to a certain extent and six months down the line you're kind of stuck in a rut that you didn't realize you were in so i think focusing on something like this specifically geared towards men um is is definitely unique and not something i've heard of before so looking forward to downloading the app after the show yeah like like the, your your listeners from a business perspective there's a great phrase in life in, in business excuse me that you, you need to spend time working on the business not in the business right you need to come up a level and look down at your business and work on it uh in life it's the same to me right we're, we're running we're running on that treadmill every day you get up and you go you know you go straight to your desk well well take a step back take a pit stop but work on on yourself not in yourself you know not just jump, jump on the treadmill that, that that's a, that's a, the, it's a simple concept right even if it's just five minutes a day take a step back draw the circle of life even if you don't use the app what are the components of your life where are you weak where, where are you strong right okay what am i going to focus on on march 24 i'm going to focus on my weak area and then you know think about how you can improve that and uh, it's not just when men when men think about well-being they always just say it's the gym isn't it it's the gym <laughs> like <laughs> It's so much more than a gym. It's it's relationships, it's mental health, it's career, it's finance. Oh, if you don't have a balance with all of those, you're not going to be great at any of them. It's such, such an important point. And uh, yeah, no, I can't understate that enough. Um, listen, Emmett, really, really enjoyed the chat. If anyone's interested in getting in contact with you, where can they find you? Uh, th thank you again for having us, Tom. Um, the website is the Um I look forward to chatting. Uh, anyone who wants to thoughtfully plan an exit in one to two years. Uh, very happy to, to talk it through with them. Perfect. Thanks very much, Emmett. Great to chat. See you soon. Bye. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye.